a little bit earlier than that, so I do apologize by about getting getting started a little bit late. That means we'll just have to go three minutes late, and uh, it just makes makes perfect sense. Thank you, Holy Coons. Hey, all of you guys, if you want, those that are close to windows, why don't you go ahead and stand up? You can you can throw up some of these blinds if you want to get a little bit more light. Maybe not that much light, but you can throw them up if you want. Um, I was over here this morning, and uh, it's been extremely hot the last couple of days, so. I have been doing my due diligence every service. Now the the big furnace and air conditions on my app, so I can put it on a schedule. But these guys, I could run them for a dollar a day. But I'm thinking, well, why even do it a dollar a day? Why not just come over on a Wednesday and turn them on? And I've been trying to do my due diligence to turn them on and off, and yet so that they, you know, they're working efficient uh, to save, especially since. Um, Electric has gone up, in case anybody has noticed that. Uh, electric has gone up. Somehow it doesn't seem fair. We'll mention other things that have gone up in price as the Bible study uh, progresses. And uh, I'm glad to see everybody tonight. Those um, that are here, there are some that are still not here, brother and sister wise. Um, I vis visited him yesterday. He's he's over there at Guy Singer. And, uh, you know, with his COPD, I think it is, and stuff, and uh, it stuff gets into his lungs. Um, but we had a good talk over there. It's nothing life-threatening at this point in time. He's still uh, wiry and snappy. And, uh, you know, he was telling me the doctor came in and said, do you think you can go home? He's like, no, I ain't going home. He's like, I'm not feeling any better. What a waste of a hospital if I have to go home the same way I came. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, he's going to pull through this pretty good. So, man, I'm, I, I love it. Sister Wise, um, just lift her up in prayer. There's some stomach complications, nothing to do with COVID, but stomach complications that she's having. And talk to Brother Adams today. Um, Sister Adams, for those that don't know, she fell. She broke her shoulder, and the impact has escalated uh, Alzheimer's. And um, she's in the nursing home now in Valley View up in Montoursville. And so lift her up, keep her in prayer. But Brother Adams was a little disgusted. He said, and uh, he wasn't even really around sight and sound or any of that. But he said, you know, I got the COVID shot and I got a booster shot and I've gotten COVID two times. He's like, I'm sick of the lies. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'll just bite my tongue on this one and I get it. Sick of the lies. We got several people in here that have taken COVID shots and booster shots and they have been sicker than most people who haven't. And so, um, yeah. About that, we'll just teach on Bible study and stay in the Bible and, and not move on past that. And so uh, we just, at some point in time, don't believe everything mainstream media is pushing. That is for sure. And so, and uh, it's the truth. It's not even spiritual, but I'm getting more amen saying than that than I do when I'm preaching the Bible. My Lord, have mercy. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. A seven-day fast is over uh, today. It was a little bit easier for me than yet uh, Monday and then also Tuesday. I did did three full days, Tuesday night, went to Wednesday night, Wednesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday night, and then I ate after I preached the revival Friday night there. Thank you for everybody that went down and um, participated. They always come up here, and it was a blessing for us to go down there. What a great spirit of worship and liberty down there. And they are, they are our dear friends. They are our dear friends. And so a Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, um, Sunday evening, I should say, after dinner and stuff, I started again three days, but I went dinner to dinner. And uh, appreciate those who have covered. Um, I do want to say this, that everybody can do something. And uh, that's one reason why I was pretty adamant about being off of social media, because I know that there's people that when I say fast, you are not going to fast food. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Every one of us can do 24 hours. Um, people, for example, like Brother Nevis that has to take uh, medication or, you know, Brother Coons, um, you, you have to eat with that because there's nothing worse than taking medication that upsets your stomach on an empty stomach. That makes you sick. But when you eat, you don't have to eat your favorite meal. You don't have to eat your favorite food. You could eat something that you absolutely detest, but at the same time, it settles your stomach. So there are things that we can do. And I'm pretty, pretty going to be pretty adamant that if you do not say no to your flesh, that you'll never really be who God's wanting you to be. End of story. If you can't push away a plate for 24 hours, if you can't say no to social media, news, TV, all that for 24 hours, seven days, 
there's priority problems in your life. Amen. And so I I ended up eating um, from dinner, dinner to dinner. And honestly, I couldn't even hardly eat. I made uh, Jess had gotten a steak. I, I smoked the steak on the Traeger, cut it up, and I ate like five slices. And I'm like, oh. Nope, I got Bible study tonight, so I even pushed it away, but I told Jeremy, I think it was, it's like, you know, just staying in a constant place where you're telling yourself no for something goes a long way. And Brother Barnes said he made it a habit that that every day he would tell himself his flesh no for something. If he wanted, if he wanted, um, you know, his chocolate stampede at Longhorn, no. You know, if he wanted, <laughs> which I don't know how he had the willpower to do that, my Lord. <laughs> Now they made it easy because they haven't had chocolate stampede in a while. But if he wanted soda, no, I'm going to drink water all day today. End of story. Just get in the habit of telling your flesh no. We make it so comfortable to live here in the United States of America that really what is biblical fasting we don't even get to because we have to detox and we have to we have so much stuff in the form of comfort that we have to say no to that really it's not even a, a real sacrifice of our flesh. But thank you for those who who, who uh, went along and you fasted, you made an effort, you said no to your flesh. I am, I am adamant that we are going to keep our foot on the neck of our adversary, and we're going to make sure that not only are we trying to take more territory, but we're going to remain the dominant force with the territory that God has given us and entrusted us, and we're going to do that by prayer and fasting. Last week I started talking about kingdom priorities, and I know I kind of, um, stopped with the lifestyle Christianity. That is important. I miscalculated how I thought church camp was this week. I, I'm all messed up. And so I thought, well, why continue lifestyle Christianity, especially in regards to our eye gate, um, guarding our eyes when I have at least three lessons to teach and I wouldn't be able to get through them all. Then we're off for church camp. And so I, even though I miscalculated, um, I'm going to I still felt it was pretty important to talk about kingdom priorities especially leading up and during our seven-day fast. And so we talked about kingdom priorities. And last week um, I made this comment that we are devoted to God by giving him our life. That is how we, um, we know that we're a disciple. Um, we've denied ourselves. We have given him our life. But we are, our devotion belongs to God, and God is asking for our entire Life, not a not a Sunday portion of our life, not a Wednesday portion of our life, but a Sunday through Sunday portion of our life where we give him everything in all manner of conversation. Be holy. He wants everything. Romans 12 one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not too much for God to ask for you just to present your body a living sacrifice to him. When he gave everything for you, it's only your reasonable service now to give 100% back to God. And so we are commanded in Scripture to be completely and wholly devoted to God, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, everything devoted to God. And let me just pause for a moment and say just um, – Lori and Rob and them are not here. I'm thankful that they were willing to do life group. But this morning, a little faithers, she woke up and she was not feeling well. She went like literally a whole time, 10 days, feeling great. And then she wasn't feeling well today. And so they just said, I told them and they were thinking the same thing. Just stay back, relax, rest, watch online. So Rob and Lori, uh, our life group care pastors, we love you. We're praying for you. Faith, you better not be making this up, young lady. Um, I'll come down and get you. But we love them, guys, and we're thankful for them. So we are commanded to be completely and wholly devoted to God. We talked about idolatry in the Old Testament, and we watched how when Israel would turn their love and their, their affections away from God, they would then put their love and affection towards other idols or other gods, little g, so Baal or whoever it is that they were serving at that time or they were being led away even even when they came out of Egypt, M Moses was on Mount Sinai, and then um, he, the people got Aaron to make them a god, a formed uh, image of, of their gold and stuff like that. And so regardless, what, what idolatry is is when you take your love, your devotion, your affection that you give to God, and you put it somewhere else. Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow that down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, 
the Lord thy God am a jealous God. You know what I did not see happen today anywhere? I did not see Brother Apple and Sister Apple walking in Walmart, their favorite place to walk. And Brother Apple has Sister Apple on one arm, and then he has another honey on the other arm. I did not see that today. I'm not sure I would ever see that unless it was Laura Lynn holding his arm as a daughter. You know why? Because in a proper relationship, you can only give your love and your devotion to one person solely. That's why uh, uh, Jacob had problems with his wives. Maybe that's why we only have one wife. <laughs> it's because Rachel and Leah, there were two different wives. And, and even though he could care less that, that, that Rachel didn't bear any children, she was a beautiful, fair woman to look at. And so he had the beauty here and the childbearer here. And, and yet the childbearer now is making fun of the beautiful woman. The beautiful one is now getting upset, and she's all bitter, and her soul is in anguish, and there's just all this commotion going on. Listen, just have one, honey. That is the moral of the story. Just have one, all right, one woman to love and to give your devotion to. But if you would to give, were to give your love and devotion to someone else, now you're causing jealousy. And, and God says this. He says, I am the Lord, and I am a jealous God. He does not want your love and devotion to be split into thirds or split into to half so that you're given half here and half there. He wants all of your devotion. He wants all of your life. I mean, he's in a relationship with you. And so when God says, I'm a jealous God, he is basically drawing this, this picture of a relationship, and he is demanding that we give him everything. It's not a hard thing for us to understand. It shouldn't be. Even in our twisted world that we live in today, in our messed up world, um, where all kinds of ideologies are being pushed and the spirit of this world is as corrupt as it's ever been. It is still commonly accepted that a, a marriage is between one man and one woman, a husband and a wife. That's still commonly accepted. I get it. The squeaky wheel knows how to make a lot of noise. But if you were to take a poll, it's still commonly accepted that a man and a woman define what a marriage really is. Amen. And so idolatry in the Old Testament was when Israel would set their affections to another God. They would stop serving God, lean into serving Baal or whoever. And so spiritual idolatry then, when we move into the New Testament, Jesus really deals with this, and he gives us insight into how we can govern our lives so that we're not committing spiritual idolatry, that we're not giving our love and our devotion that's supposed to go to God to something or someone else. There's a reason why, side note, there's a reason why out in the middle of nowhere, when I was just preaching in Appleton, Wisconsin, and we drove north to a lake, um, uh, um, Lake Michigan, excuse me, and we were in the, the Green Bay Bay, and we were fishing for walleye and smallmouth. There's a reason why out in the middle of nowhere, there is a massive stadium called Green Bay Stadium out in the middle of nowhere that, that fl are, are 100,000 plus people gravitate to. There's a love, and there's a misplaced devotion. The world, we will find it throughout every, every avenue or venue in the world. There is a misplaced worship. Okay, there is a misplaced giving of ourselves to something that cannot give back. Sports is just one of them. But Jesus sets priorities for us, and he gives us kingdom priorities. And so he says in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And then he says this, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Kingdom priorities. What really matters in life? What, what really pulls at your heart strand the most? Okay. Now, no doubt, if I was to say it's either you're going to, you know, be dangled over the lake of fly, fire and the flames are going to lick up your leg and you're going to feel the heat and, and you're going to spend eternity in hell. Well, of course, your eternity matters most. But what really tells the story of what matters most is your daily life and what you do on a daily habit. Priorities can get so far out of whack so easily.
so, so easily. Every decision that you make should first be run through the gauntlet of kingdom priorities. Where your children go to school, what job you are working, how many hours you will give of yourself to that particular job, why you want a new car, why you want a bigger house, why you want more money, why you think this boyfriend or girlfriend is the right choice for you, Every area of life has to be ran through the gauntlet of kingdom priorities. Notice none of the things that I said were wrong in and of itself. But if you have the wrong priorities, they can destroy you. The list is forever and and the reasons why can go on and on. But your life is supposed to be dedicated solely to God. We were bought with a price, and we were commanded to glorify God in both. Well, glorify God in both your body and your spirit, which are His. I'm pretty sure I just m- mixed God and body in that word when I said God, Gotti. <laughs> Gotti. That's. That, I just heard. I heard myself say it, and I'm looking at him like I just mixed God and body together. The prerequisite of discipleship is denying self. In other words, you're not in pursuit of building your own kingdom, but his. And so for those in the kingdom of God, the question is, is what really matters in life? Again, if I take heaven here and and hell here and you can feel the heat of hell and you can see the eternal punishment, you will no doubt say, oh, the kingdom of God matters. But being that both hell and heaven are in eternity, and we're living in the present, it's the present that tells the biggest story of where your priorities in your life really is. You know, let me just throw this out there that just comes to my mind. Jess and I, when we traveled, we were down in, in um, Florida, and my Aunt Karen, she had, I, I don't know, what she have? She, somehow she was able to watch HG, HGTV. I just want to make sure I said it right. Which is a wholesome show. Um, it really is. It, it, and that's where Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know, they do their home improvements and they, they tear down their homes and they re- rebuild other homes, which that intrigues me. You know, being able to, to tear out a back wall in the sanctuary and a year later still not finish the drywall because I hate the drywall. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. I'm going to talk to a guy at church camp that does that stuff for a living and be like, hey, bro, you're going to do me a solid. I need you. Oh, man, I'd call on Sister Cooper, but she is in the same boat I am when she looks at f- it's it's not even doing the first and the second coat. It's the finishing work. And uh, yeah, anyway, you know, but we would watch that just to relax. And it was cool when it's wholesome. It's not sinful entertainment. And then, you know, after a while, I realized I realized just by watching a simple show how the spirit of the world can creep into your your mind and into your thinking. And before you know it, you're walking into your house and saying, oh, well, well, maybe this wall needs a little shiplap and this wall needs a little wainscoting. And maybe maybe we should get and repaint our table and we should do this and we should do that. And there's nothing wrong with remodeling and updating and any of that. But when you ingest that nonstop, you can realize and you can see how quickly your mind and your priorities and your godly contentment can be changed. And next thing you know, you want to redo the whole house and buy new sofas and all this stuff. Why? Because your contentment level has changed by what you're putting into your mind. And getting a new sofa, redoing the kitchen, making something nice or taking care of and doing preventative maintenance, none of that is wrong. But how quickly can our priorities and our affections go from something that is kingdom value to now our own kingdom? Paul said this, 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. One trip over to Africa, we'll come back feeling very, very thankful for what we have and where we're at in life. I promise you that. For we brought nothing, verse 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain 
<laughs> it's, not even, it's not even up for debate. It is certain, he said, we'll take nothing with us. How many times have you ha- ever heard it? How many have seen the, 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 what, the U-Haul following the hearse? Say it again. How many people have ever seen a U-Haul carrying all those possessions behind the hearse? No, there's too many greedy family members to let that happen. As soon as you're done, let me tell you, World War II starts with your family. I get the house, you get the land, you get the cars. And if you don't know what I'm saying, make sure you've got a will already established. <laughs> Please, spare the rest of us. And having food and raiment, let us be Therewith content. Let me stop and pause and say this just for a second. Having possessions is not wrong. I want to I make sure that we're walking in balance. Because you can read scriptures and, and you can go far to the far right or to the far left. The far left, excuse me, is your kingdom priorities are messed up. But then you can go to the far right. And, and never take thought or never plan or never never take care of what you have and you get all out of whack. I am going to try my best to, to walk down the line of balance here today. Having possessions are not wrong. There are many people in the Bible who had great possessions, Abraham being one of them. I'd rather draw conclusions from the New Testament. The Bible says this in the early church that there were two people. Joseph, Acts chapter 4, verse 36, who by the apostles were surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. That's that's like a sweet name. Like Barnabas, which really means the son of consolation. A Levite, country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it. He didn't have to sell it, but he was a man that had Plenty land, enough land to sell. He takes the income of that land and he puts it at the apostles' feet so that he could build the kingdom of God. The very next chapter opens up with a man and a woman called Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, who also had possessions. They sold their land, kept back part of it, and then took the remains, the other half or how much ever, and put it at the apostles' feet to come across as if they gave everything. See what I'm saying? Both of them had lands. Both of them had possessions. Both of them sold their possessions and gave, but one had faulty motives and faulty priorities in life. They wanted the glory, and they wanted to look like Joseph did, or Barnabas did, but yet they didn't want to pay the true price. And so they lied. And Peter calls them out on the carpet in Acts chapter 5, and he said, you didn't lie to men. You lied, you lied to God. You might have tried to fool men, but you're never going to fool God. And I want to read something that, that Peter said that I don't have in my notes Verse 3 of chapter 5, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? In other words, when it was in your possession, was it not thine? You didn't have to sell it. There was nothing that said you had to sell this land because it was extra land, a little bit more than what you truly needed to sustain life. The possession was not bad. The saying is this, the possessions are not bad. As long as you own the possessions, then the possessions don't own you. And so Barnabas and Ananias both own possessions, but there's a clear difference in motives here and priorities here. Barnabas just gives it up and says, hey, no big deal. God gave it to me. I'm going to give it back to God. Ananias says, you know what? I'm going to give it, but I'm going to hold back part of it. I'm going to keep a part of that. There was a residue, a remnant of that possession, that material in his heart. 
And it cost him. It cost him big time. Matter of fact, I believe it was Lori text and said, because I'm always saying you lie, you fry, especially in the house of God. They were reading this and and basically um, they read where he fell down dead. And, and Anna, or, or Richard said this. He's like, it's not you lie, you fry. It's you lie, you die. And so, again, having possessions is not wrong as long as the possessions don't have you. Kingdom priorities. First John 2, 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is this, the lust of the flesh, number one, the lust of the eyes, number two, and the pride of life. Everything in the world can be summed up in those three categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The world passes, the lust thereof passes, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So Bishop Smith, he taught this, that the lust of the flesh is the desire to do. The lust of the eyes is the desire to have. And then the pride of life is the desire to be. And kingdom priorities in particularly are challenged with the last two, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The desire to have a better car, larger kitchen, bigger garage, more money, better bank account. The desire to have more. You cannot just rest and wake up in the morning and be like, you know what? I'm thankful. I'm blessed. God has blessed the socks off me with what I have, contentment and godliness. But there's something inside of a person that is always desiring and longing for more of fill in the blank. Again, anything that I mention is not wrong in and of itself. It's your priorities. It's your motives. And then Paul, he says this, godliness with contentment is is great gain. But the desire to have and the desire to be. And so we're going to try to find balance in, in all of this and and, and I'm going to admit, and I talked with Jeremy today, our car salesman, pretty much if you don't buy a car from him, his kids go without, and it's all your fault. So. <laughs> I better get tipped for that. That's just an inside joke. But I'm considering selling. We're finding balance. I'm considering selling my Ford Explorer. Okay, it's paid off. Thank the Lord. It has 156, almost 157,000 miles. Just barely broken in for me. It has scratches. I was driving to Bloomsburg doing the work of the Lord on the phone with a buddy, and I look up, and literally out of nowhere, a big old mama doe comes running across the road, and I went, whoa, and I ripped it over into the berm to miss her. Well, that clown literally ran right into the back of my truck head first, uh, and I was like, man, I just hit a deer, and I turned around. A guy was walking down the yard, and I'm trying to find this deer because I ain't letting a deer lay on the road. It's going into the back of the truck ASAP, uh, and guess what? That doe literally fell into the grass, looked up, shook her head, got up, and ran off in the woods. And now I got a head print on the side of my door. And when it first happened, I had snot and saliva all down the side of my truck where she blew her nose. She's like, it's not just good enough. I'm going to dent your car. I'm going to blow my nose all over your car. I, I was bitter. It's like, you dented my car, and I couldn't even eat your back straps. It just made me feel like I'm, I'm making a difference in this church when Michelle and Jeremy were driving down the road and there's a bunch of deer out. And they go, oh, isn't it so beautiful? And Ollie's first things, call pastor so he can pew them. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm making a difference <laughs> one child at a time. And when he says pew them, he means shoot them and pew them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that truck has had several dead turkeys in it. That truck has had roadkill. I better not say that too loud. It's really not <laughs> of legal practices to take that unless you get a tag. But nonetheless, the deer that was shot out or hit out here, I picked it up and took it. I ain't going to let that thing go to waste. It's had my own deer in it. I hate to be gruesome, but it's also had deer blood in it. <laughs> it is what it is. It washes up. 
It's just broken in, just like I like it. I just spent $400 on it today to get inspected and two rear coil springs on it. Mm, hate that. I don't want to have to have, like, a brand-new car. Nothing wrong with it, but I go up into the mountains to hunt, and if I hit a branch and it puts a scrape in my car, I'm okay with that. If I have a brand-new car that, that, like, you know, looks amazing, and I get a scratch, I'm like, oh, man. So this vehicle serves me. <laughs> it serves the purpose. There's nothing wrong with taking care of your vehicles. But it's a very fine line when people get out of balance and they begin to serve the vehicle. I'm going to tell you, your vehicle is going to get a stone chip. If you want me to, if you got a brand new vehicle, I'll get a stone and throw it and hit your car just to just to break the ice, <laughs> just to get it out of the way. And I remember I bought a brand new bow. I put a, a D loop a D loop on it. I drew this bow back and halfway back, and I draw with an open hand. And halfway back, the D loop <laughs> D loop broke. I punched myself in the mouth, busted my lip, and my brand new bow goes shooting five or six feet in front of me and lands on the ground and chips up the brand new riser. I'm like, oh, it's like I fall to my knee. I don't care about my teeth that are broken and bloody lip. It's like my new bow. <laughs> I don't serve my vehicle. This vehicle serves me. I have a vehicle so that I can get to point A to point B. My vehicle is not a silent communication piece in my community that speaks of my status. My vehicle is not a silent communication piece that pets my ego of pride that says, look at me driving down the road in a brand new car. And what do other people think about my vehicle? Two completely different things. My vehicle serves me to get to point A, and point a to point B. Brother Coons has a truck. You know why? Because he's a man's man. He's got more tools at his home than Lowe's and Home Depot combined. Oh, come on, sister. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's godliness. Amen. Because he works outside. You know, I, I can't see him driving a Lexus around with a hatch open and a two-by-four propping the hood up. And then he's got chainsaws and jigsaws and, and air compressors hanging out of the back. So he has a vehicle that serves him. Right? So what I'm saying is that your material possessions inside are so that you can have a silent talking piece that pets your ego of pride that look, makes you look like you're successful that makes you fit in with the cool cats and the new home development, if that's your motive, you got kingdom priorities that are out of whack. And so I'm looking for a new vehicle. You know why? Because I'm paying $400 plus a month in gas. I'm looking for a new vehicle, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not throwing stones because I honestly don't care, but since the new presidency has changed, gas has almost doubled in price. And it's not just gas, it's a purposeful agenda that has literally increased everything in the United States of America. It's socialism in disguise. And it is what it is, I don't care. I, I'm serving God, and I read the back of the book, I know that things are coming, I know that things are falling apart, it is what it is, there's nothing I can do. I do what I can do at the voting poll, and at that, it is what it is, it's in God's hand. It's a purpose agenda. Makes no lick of sense to shut down our independence as a nation. And so guess what? You know what has gone up? Electric, gas, your food, the cost at dinner, the cost at the tool road. The airplane tickets have literally doubled. I used to be able to get a flight for 200 to $300. Now my flight to Little Rock next Sunday, guess how much it is? It's almost $600, and that's the cheapest flight I could get. It was almost 1000 the next cost up. Everything has gone up. You know what hasn't gone up? My pay. You know what else hasn't gone up? Most of your pay. There's some that have gotten new jobs and raises, and I'm grateful for that. Tip God 20%, that's all. I'm kidding. <laughs> no matter what you tip God here, it doesn't affect my pay. 
I'm thankful for the few that have been blessed, but guess what? There's some that we're still living off of a previous economy, and now everything in life has gone up. So what does that do? That financial squeeze, it makes us walk a balancing line. Why am I driving a truck that gets 16 to 19 miles a gallon in town when most of my driving's in town? And I'm paying $400 to $450. Because of that, I'm starting to look at, okay, what can be more cost effective, but yet still have a third row seat because I have a family of five. And any, any parent in the right mind knows that you cannot travel across town with three kids sitting in the same seat beside each other. <laughs> That's ridiculous. We had a Ford Taurus four-cylinder, and we would drive from here to Florida, 65 mile per hour, and no cell phones and nothing, just looking out the window. And finally, we just start picking at each other until we fight, and then we get yelled at, and then we have to look out the window some more. And now we can't even drive over to the Perkins restaurant and not hear fighting. So do you understand what I'm saying? There has to be a balance of your priorities, of your mindset. First Timothy 6, 9, but they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition or sin. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. It's the love of money. Which while some coveted after more money, more possessions, more power, more, 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 while some has coveted after the Bible says this, that they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So I have friends that have a call of God on their life, but they will never, they'll never fulfill the call of God. You know why? Because they can't let go of this world and this world's goods. Because if the call of God cost them balancing their checkbook and only having 18 cents for two and a half weeks, they won't do it because that makes them uncomfortable. Because they don't want to live in a place of uncomfortableness. And yet the cost of God, the cost of the cross, Paul said thrice, I suffered a night and a day in the deep. Thrice I was beaten with rods, naked and perils of countrymen, perils of robbers, perils at sea, hungers and thirst often. See what I'm saying? If Paul's motives was more, more gain here, he would have never been the man that he was. He was who he was because he said no to his kingdom, and he reached for kingdom priorities. Matthew 19, 6, and behold, one man came unto him and said, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, he says, of Jesus, which Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, commit no adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I done from my youth, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, This is the only other man in Scripture that I know of that had a personal invitation from Jesus himself. If thou be perfect, go sell everything that thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. Give everything you have here to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. He could not make that connection. You know why? Because priorities were messed up. And the Bible says this in verse 22, but that young man, when he heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. And Jesus said, verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It was a real life example of what Paul was speaking about. The only other man, again, to have a personal invitation from Jesus, we watched as his priorities was messed up and he could not make that difference. He pierced himself through with many sorrows. He literally heard, if you're going to make eternity and make heaven your home and you're going to do the will of God, you've got to give this up and pursue this. And he walked away choosing the possessions. Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, their no, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought of the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The New International Version says this, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> if you don't believe that, just listen to the news. And so, again, kingdom priorities, our first love, our first priority in life has to be the kingdom of God. And Revelation, I mentioned this 
Literally, they kept the name of the Lord. They, they didn't deny their works. They kept faithful in a lot of the things. But he said, I still have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You're doing everything that's right, but guess what? Your heart's not behind it. You're doing the things just because. It's now a religion. It's, the relationship is gone. Your, your first love has been forsaken. I'm your first love, Jesus is saying. You're doing all the right things, but you're not in love with me. And so what matters most is not your house, your bank account, your 401K, relationships in life, your social status, what cars in the driveway, how many material possessions you have. Amen. What matters most is that you walk with God. What matters most is that you keep your affections on the things that are above, not on this earth. I promise you, the more stuff I have, the more frazzled I feel. The more stuff we, we, we okay, let's be honest. So I'll throw stones at me and pick on me, but, but I always thought it'd be cool that, that when the kids were at school, Jess and I could get into kayaks, and we could go over to the lake, and we could just kayak. You know why? Because there's nothing wrong with kayak. It's wholesome fun between a, a husband and, and, and a wife, and as, as we got kayaks, we had a little extra money. We got two kayaks, two life jackets, the oars, and we stuffed them into the back of the Ford, and guess what? For two years now, guess how many times we've taken the kayaks out? We took them out once, and it was, it was hot as all hot get out. And I'm just like three strokes into the oil. I'm like, what are we doing out here? I'm going to die of heat exhaustion. So that was about 20 minutes out there on, on the lake. We took them up to the lake last year during camping. And one more time, I'm sorry, three times. And we took them up once. And I said, you know what? Honestly, this is, quite, this is a lot of work to be canoeing all the way across the lake. Why not just, just get a canoe and put a blue motor on and we can scoot across there and find the fish a lot faster. And so now I have the responsibility of two kayaks, a kayak rack, and two oars, and a life jacket. It's just sitting in my garage doing what? So I can go out once a year? I told her after camping this time, let's just sell them things. Let's put it towards hunting. A moped. Now, that's a worthy investment. You know why? Did I tell you gas prices have almost doubled, <laughs> if not doubled? <laughs> So there's a place of death that people can get to where we deny ourselves, which it's not about ourselves anymore. It, it's just not about my kingdom. It, it's, it's literally, we do, we do what we can. We navigate this earth. We try to make our best decisions. We make good financial decisions. We're, we're good stewards. We take care of what God gave us. But you know what? If we have a new car, we have it. If we don't have it, we don't have it. If we, if we, if we have a better house, we have it. If we don't have it, we don't have it. It's, this world is not our priorities. And so Paul said this. I've, I've learned in times where I abounded. In other words, when I'm traveling, you know what? This church, they paid me good. I went out to Longhorn Steakhouse. And these other th other churches, they didn't. I learned how to <laughs> I learned how to struggle a little bit. But it doesn't matter. Neither whatever whatever state I am in, are you hearing me? Whatever state I am, I am in. I have learned to be content therewith. And so here's what happens: is we when we're in a state of plenty, we love it. But when we're in a state of not so plenty, famine, we murmur, we complain, we think God doesn't love us, and we struggle with our life's purpose and our life's values. And so we cannot be in pursuit of God and in pursuit of the money, pursuit of this world, this world's goods. God demands our absolute loyalty. And so in the New Testament, spiritual idolatry happens when we allow our kingdom to rob our desires and our affections from his kingdom. I asked the question, and I got a kick out of this, and just hang tight with me. Um, we didn't have church Sunday, so I got to do life steps, life talk, and preaching all tonight. Here's one way that you know that you have idols in your life. Are you ready? You thought you were ready last week, and I, I love the looks on your faces. I'll be honest with you. What's the first thing you think about when you wake up and the last thing you think about when you go to bed? <laughs> She's like, sleep. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer. In fact, I was like, when I wake up, I still want to sleep. And before I go to bed, I'm wanting to sleep. I know what your idol is, sleep. Seriously, what's the first thing you think of? And I love this part because I saw so many eye rolls. I saw husbands and wife looking at each other like, Let 
when you roll out of bed in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Do you grab your cell phone and reply to all the alerts, the text messages, the Facebook, the Instagram, Sister Coons, your Snapchat? <laughs> she don't even know what Snapchat is. <laughs> It's where you can you can put all these silly filters and you can make yourself look like a 1950s uh, uh, what what is it called a a pinup doll thing where they they they're in like these restaurants and they got the curly hair and you can you can put aliens on your head and bears and all this uh, all these avatars and stuff yeah that's like 1990s on emails <laughs> these are called life emojis. <laughs> Bit emojis, where you can literally have your phone scan your face, uh, and it puts up a cartoon version of who you are because it scans your facial features and your structure and your hair, doing all that stuff. So cool. Do you reply to your emails? Do you jump online and check the news? Do you jump online and I think if you don't jump online, do you turn on the TV and check your favorite station? What do you do when you first wake up? What is your priority? Where does your mind go? Coffee. In other words, how do you start your day? Or better yet, here it is, where do you put Jesus at in your day? And I enjoyed watching all the faces last night. Nobody's making faces this week. I mean, you guys are like Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> You guys are, I'm not giving it any. But all of the faces that I saw, it was like the Lord himself walked in and took the needle and popped the balloon when I asked this question. So what is your daily devotion like? How much time are you spending in prayer? How much time are you spending in Bible reading? There was a day. Where I woke up and I had 14 Alexander Scurby CDs that read the New Testament through in 14 CDs. An hour and 28 minutes each CD. And I would read an hour and 28 minutes of the Bible and I'd complete the New Testament through twice a month. And I did that for years. And although that is a pretty high, you know, standard to hold that I don't hold anymore. What it taught me was this. There's power in ingesting the word daily. Because even though I didn't remember everything, I would be going about my day and all of a sudden the word of God that I read and put into my heart that day, it would come back and it would help me navigate my day. And so I have purposely revamped the time that I'm spending in the word. I went back and I found this. I, f I have an app on my phone and it has a chronological Bible reading plan. And in six months, I'm going to read the whole Bible through in a chronological order. So I went from Psalms chapter 1 or, or Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 12, and then I jumped right into Job. And it will take you through and it will change it up. It has the reading plan for you. If you have a attention deficit disorder like I do, I would suggest maybe getting an app that has an audio Bible and you can do a reading plan. You say, you know what? The first thing that I do when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to get my coffee, get my water, get my hot water with lemon, get my tea, whatever you do in the morning. I'm going to grab my refreshments. I'm going to go to a quiet, a quiet place. Fox News and CNN isn't playing in the background. I'm going to go to a place that I have hallowed out in my day, the first fruits of my day, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read five, five chapters of the Word of God, three chapters of the Word of God. And then I'm going to spend a little time meditating and asking God to help me to apply the word of God. We need to be spending time with him. And I get it. Every day we have a decision to be Mary or Martha. We can either be the person that says, you know what, there's nothing more important to me than sitting at Jesus' feet. Or we can be cumbered about by much serving. You ever wonder why there, there are certain people that just seem to be successful in their walk with God and other people that stumble and fall and they can't ever gain traction or gain what is called biblical maturity? 100% you can trace it back to a lack of private personal devotion and time spent with Jesus. You have to have a personal re revelation of his voice 
of his lordship in your life. You can follow God because I follow God. You can come to church for 30 years because the pastor tells you to come to church and the pastor's in the word and he digs up golden nuggets for you. But there has to be a point in time in Christian maturity where you're the one that's spending time with Jesus and you're the one that's hearing his voice for your own self. And then the pastor confirms what you're hearing or your husband or whoever your spiritual leader is. You have to be able to to develop an ear. Jesus said the sheep know my voice. And so we read last week where, where there's, there's scriptures, and I'll, I'll name three of them. Psalm 63, 1, David, when he was in the wilderness, he said, Oh, God, thou art my God, early will I seek you. Proverbs 18, 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so manna would fall from heaven at the first, and when the sun would start to come up, when the sun comes up in the horizon, the horizon actually lights up, and you can actually see before the sun is actually up where you can see the sun. And so when the sun was coming up, there was a short window of time where the Israelites had to go out the first thing in the minute and get their daily bread. And I believe that what that's saying is that we need to give God the first fruits of our day, and we need to seek our daily bread before we seek anything else. They couldn't store up. They couldn't eat enough bread today to last them all week. It was a daily walk, a daily commitment. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as earth on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You can't pray that at 930 at night. Your day's already spent. You can't pray, deliver me from evil. Your day's already spent. There ain't no evil going to touch you when you lay your head down on the pillow and go to bed. So the emphasis of the Lord's Prayer is that, you know what, we're giving God our first fruits. It's the first time of our day. And you know what, I'm going to tell you, he's worthy of our first fruits. Amen. Waking up and spending time sitting down where nobody else is bothering you and you're reading the word and you're thanking the Lord and you're talking to the Lord, you're meditating on him. There's nothing like it. Amen. And so everything in the word of God is indicative of our relationship. It's all about our relationship with him. John 15, 1 through 8, I won't read it all, but basically it says, I'm the vine. My father's the husbandman, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's not a good thing. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges, that it may bring forth more fruit. He goes on to say this in verse 6. He says, if any man abide not in me, that abide is an intimate relationship. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Too many people live in a spiritual withered state. Nobody's exempt. Nobody has a badge of honor. Nobody has special privileges in the kingdom of God. I don't care if if Moses signed your yearbook. I don't care how long you've been doing it. I don't care how much money you gave over the course of your lifespan. You are not set apart as some special privileged child. We all live under the same principled, styled life. If you want to be close to Jesus, you've got to spend time with him. And if you're not abiding in him and you're not spending time with him, guess what? You're not bringing forth fruit and you're withered up. I don't want to be that. And guess what? Michelle, there's times in my life where it's harder for me to be somebody that's bringing forth fruit than somebody that's withered. Every one of us has to be intentional about our personal intimacy with Jesus Christ. Early will I seek you. And those that seek me early shall find me. Psalms 42.1. But the chief musician, as the heart pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Psalms 42.2. My soul thirsts for you, O God. Are you in a dry spell? Do you feel withered in your spiritual walk with God? Where are your priorities? Because a person that brings forth fruit, they're in love with Jesus. Their their heart's desire is to get closer to him, to please him, to be close to him. And they will carve out time in their day to make sure that their priorities are right. I was convicted at Man Up Adventure. And I'm not going to get into the whole backstory, but I was convicted because there was a day where I held the actual personal devotion a lot a lot more stringent than I did in the, the past several years. Evangelism was so hard because one night I'd teach the youth event, I'd be up to 2 in the morning. It, I can't get, a, get up at 4 in the morning and actually pray and comprehend what I'm praying. 
But then, you know, I'd sleep in and the kids would wake up before me. You can't pray and get close with God when you got three kids, a labradoodle and a shih tzu running around in a 200 square foot trailer. And so it was very difficult for me to have some type of scheduled devotion. Well, I don't have that excuse no more. And God reminded me about that. And I began to pray up on the mountain in Wyoming. God, bring me back to my first love. Don't allow my, my, allow my love for you to dwindle down and die. I said, I want to please God. I want to be close to him. I want to love him. I want to serve him. He has my life and my devotion. And by me taking 20 minutes out of my, my Bible, my day, to read the Bible and, and time out of my day to meditate upon him, that is not too much to ask to give him the first fruits of our day. Does that mean that that's the only time that you pray? No, you pray without ceasing. And that's what I had to learn to do in evangelism. Every day, I, my mind was always pinging after the Spirit of God, searching for it and trying to listen so he could guide me in the next, the next revival and guide my family and keep me where I needed to be. Psalms 119.10, with my whole heart have I sought thee. O Lord, let me not wander from thy commandments. Jeremiah 29.13, and ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. He wants your heart. Sister Anita was telling me the other day, you know how brother and sister Coons met? Brother Coons got out of his old truck one day. He had a cowboy hat on. He had cowboy boots, blue jeans, leather chaps, hanky around his neck. Don't laugh at me. You're the one that told me this. And when Sister Coons saw him, when Sister Coons saw him at the diner, she grabbed her chest and she gasped and said, <gasps> and Brother Coons just nodded his head and winked. And from that moment on, there was chemistry in the heavens. And they began to pursue each other as lovers. They began to ask each other, stop lying, you know. You lie, you die. They began to fall in love. You know how they fell in love? There was a desire in their heart to get to know each other. And when you have a desire to get to know each other, you know what you do? Sister Anita still has the love letters that they wrote. Brother Coons would write, this was before text messaging, by the way. Do you love me? Check yes or check no. Fold it up in one of those origami like swans, and he would hand it on down through the school, school aisles, and all of a sudden she would check yes. And then they would start to go out to the diner. They would start to date. They would pursue each other. And the more they would pursue each other, the more in love they found themselves until finally, one day, he tricked her into saying, I do. That is the love story of Brother and Sister Coons, <laughs> signed, sealed, and delivered by Anita. <laughs> no. I could just flip the rolls and I could tell about you coming out of that Lamborghini and Brother Bob grabbing his chest. <sighs> it's no different in your walk with God. The reason that they have been successfully married is not because there hasn't been trials, not because there hasn't been heartaches, not because there hasn't been ups and downs, but because they pursued each other in so much that they have come to the conviction, they have come to the oath that on this earth, there is nothing more important than their relationship. It doesn't matter if, if Brother Coons have provided her with a cardboard box. He might not like that, but she would be with him. Or if Brother Coons has provided her with the wonderful house that they have. Either way, their oath of love is the most important thing on this earth. Sorry, Anita. They were together before you came into the world, and they're going to be together when you leave the house. Their marriage, their intimacy is the best thing that they have going. And until we get to a place where we make an oath with the Lord that our love for you and our devotion for you is the best thing that I have going, we're going to stumble and we're going to fall and we're going to be withered and we're going to lose kingdom priorities. So many people would say, I would give my life for Jesus Christ. No, you wouldn't. You can't even give five minutes of your day. 
You can't even put off a, a plate of fasting for 24 hours. You can't even put away Facebook for a day. You wouldn't give your life. As soon as that machete was lifted up and your head was on the child, you'd be like, no, forget it. Okay. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard, but it's yet true. I heard of a missionary when I was preaching at Nigel's church. He was, he was a missionary out, and these people were like, I'll do anything for God. We would, we would give our lives for God, and then COVID hit, and he couldn't even hardly get three-quarters of his people to come back to church because of how convenient it got. Come on, let us not wander from your commandments, God. With my whole heart, I am seeking after you. I don't need to know. I'm not trying to micromanage anybody. But if the first thing you do in the morning is anything other than get up, get your drink, your refreshments, brush your teeth, all that stuff, and then grab your word and spend a little bit of time and give him your first fruits, I would highly encourage you to make it a oath in your life that I'm going to give him my first fruits of my day and see how your walk with God changes. You want to find spiritual purpose, you want to find spiritual destiny, start searching after him with all your heart, and you will find him. Amen. I sure love you. I sure appreciate you. Church camp is coming up. Jess has an announcement. Church camp is coming up. So we're going to have service at the Danville campus. Bloomsburg is canceled because all of us are driving down there and we're taking a bunch of people down to church camp. I'm so glad for those people that have, have been able to get off work. Some have, some haven't. Um, but you're going to enjoy it. Um, Aaron Bounds was going to be the night speaker, but something happened. And so now Tim Green is the night speaker the whole time. And so you'll be blessed to hear that, you know. And uh, he did tell me, he's like, you know, Aaron, uh, I feel like there's a few, like two messages that I know that I've ministered at your church at one point in time. He's like, you know, your thoughts. I'm like, it don't matter. We'll act like we never heard it before. We'll be your best preachers, you know what I mean? And plus, you can hear something more than once and be blessed, you know. But we're going to la let him flow in the Holy Ghost and bless us. But I love you. God bless you. Jess, would you come? Just real quick, in regards to Mother's Memorial Offering, I know some people asked me. It was actually due this past Sunday, but because we had to cancel church and so forth, I'm going to talk with Sister Heath, who is our Secretary for the State, about giving it. I'm going to send it in right after church camp. So if you do have Mother's Memorial money, if you don't have it tonight, that's fine. You can bring it Sunday. Just let me know. I do want to get that check written. I know some people said they wanted to give it to me, um, so I kind of extended it for at least a week. So if anybody has that, just let me know. Thank you.